Welcome to the Revival Animal Health webinar on parasites. This is part one intestinal parasites and worms. My name is Shelly. I'm the content manager at Revival Animal Health. And we have today Dr. Greer, Director of Veterinary Services at Revival. And she's joining us. Dr. Greer has more than 40 years of experience in veterinary medicine. So Dr. Greer, take it away. Tell us all about parasites. Well, um, parasites are one of my favorite topics. A little background on me. Um, I have been at a veterinary school 41 years. We started our practice 40 years ago. So we're pretty excited that we had a longevity to celebrate our 40th anniversary. This is my dear husband with our um, litter of corgis from 2014. So they are now approaching nine years of age that is hard to even imagine. Um, the little one from the left won our national in 2016. So it's very exciting um, that we've been blessed to have um, some pretty nice lines of dogs. So today we're gonna talk about what a parasite is what a zoonotic disease is, um, zoonotic, zoonotic, depending on how you want to say it. What are the most common parasites, internal versus external parasites? And then for each parasite, we're going to go through what the parasite looks like, what its life cycle is, what its symptoms are, the diagnosis, the treatment, and the prevention. Um, we're also going to include in that whether it's safe for some of these medications to be used on pregnant and nursing bitches. But we can't forget about our boys because they're part of a breeding program as well. So we're going to go through each of these. Now, life cycle sounds pretty boring, like kind of horrible, but I'm just going to highlight the one thing in each parasite's life cycle that you need to know to get good parasite control. Because without that, you're going to miss being able to um, understand and manage these parasites in the best way possible. Because the less medication you have to buy, the less medication you have to give, um, the fewer parasites that your pets have, the, the happier everybody is. So I just want to be really clear about that. So we're going to go through a few basic principles of parasite control. Uh, and these sound, these sound really basic, like why do I even need to talk about this? But I think uh, it's really important. And the first is to really weigh your dogs accurately, whether it's a puppy or an adult dog, get an accurate weight on that patient before you start administering medication. Um, giving the wrong dose of medication may be too much. It may be toxic. If you give not enough, it's not going to work well. So use a scale. Um, you can get a platform scale for not a lot of money for your kennel. If you have large breed dogs, I would strongly encourage you to do that. Um, they're sometimes around $150 or not terribly expensive. And then these smaller scales to weigh your puppies again, are uh, very affordable. And I like the small scales that weigh in both grams and ounces. So I'd encourage you to have a small scale. And if you have large breed dogs, a large scale also. I have one client that he's a, he's a pet guy. He doesn't breed dogs, but he has Great Danes, Newfoundlands, um, all large breed dogs. And he told me I have a scale at my house. And I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever. Because you know most bathroom scales, by the time you pick up, if you can pick up your 150 pound dog, which most of us can't, the scale is going to go over the top of what the mat, the maximum amount of that scale will be. So I thought that's kind of what he meant when he had a scale. Well, I went to his house one day to do a euthanasia and in his front entry next to the grandfather clock is a platform scale. So when he tells me he's weighing his dogs, he's not kidding. He is giving me accurate weights. So accurate weights are terribly important. Secondly, you want to calculate the dose accurately. So, you know, don't hold the puppy up and say, well, I think it's about two pounds, so I'm going to give about one cc. That's not good enough. You really need to calculate the dose accurately. Now, if you have a med medication that comes as a suspension, such as fenbendazole, such as Albon, such as Nemex, such as Strongid, when you first get that bottle, the very day it comes from Revival in your little box, take it out, shake it really well, like a paint shaker, like get the whole thing suspended. And then break it down into smaller bottles so that you've got these aliquots for two reasons. One is it's going to give you a more uniform distribution through that dose of medication through the whole liter of the medication that you're using. Number two, some of the medications are sensitive to exposure to air. And if you have it in a smaller bottle, there's less air exposure. So the medication will stay potent longer. So Revival has these extra bottles. All you have to do is go online include those with your order. And then when you get them, so depending on what, what you're getting, you may want to get a couple of four ounce bottles so that you've got enough to distribute a 16 ounce bottle. You need four of them. If you're getting a bigger bottle, then of course get more, but I would encourage you to get two to four ounce bottles so that you can break it down into smaller quantities. Fourth is when you're using some of these large animal medications, which we're going to talk about a little bit, 
don't use the tubes of medications, use the suspensions. So get the big bottles of suspension. The tubes of medication, <clears throat> number one, are meant for a 1500 pound animal. And it's very difficult to accurately dose that. And number two, um, it tends not to have the medication uniformly suspended through that tube and it's very hard to suspend it equally. So don't get the, the tubes of paste, get the bottles of medication. Number five is you need to remove organic material before you try to disinfect. So this um, picture has an example of one of those dog waste systems that you can bury in the ground and then pick up the stools and put into there so that you have less organic material. If you try to disinfect through organic material, the disinfectant won't work. So if you're having a struggle with parvo, with parasites, with um, kennel cough, with any of the infectious diseases, the first thing you need to do before you disinfect is remove the organic material, pick it up, use soap um, as a surfactant, maybe steam clean, and then use your disinfectant and follow the disinfectant directions. Use the right dilution, more is not better. <clears throat> use the right amount. Don't guess, don't pour some into a bigger bucket and then figure out how much is there. You need to measure it because it tells you on the package. And don't miss, mix disinfectants together because some can form a toxic gas. I was told about somebody the other day whose technician mixed two things together and ended up in the hospital with a very severe burn in her lungs. So just don't mix things together. Bleach does not play nice with other things. You can use bleach, but don't use it in the same bucket or the same bottle as some of the other products. All right, so today we're gonna to primarily talk about intestinal parasites for dogs. Roundworms, hookworms, whipworms, tapeworms, and of course this lists heartworm, which is not an intestinal parasite, but still is a parasite that we commonly see in dogs. So we're gonna to talk today about the appearance of the parasite, what its life cycle is, the symptoms, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. And it's all broken this way down in your handout as well, because I wanted this handout to be consistent. Um, I don't have everything in the handout that's on the slide and vice versa, but it's all in the same basic pattern. So for, very first question is, what is a parasite? A parasite is by definition an organism that lives in or on an organism of another species, its host, and benefits by deriving nutrients at the other's expense. So by definition, your children cannot be parasites because they're the same species. Even though if your 30 year old son is still living in your basement and you feel like he might be a parasite, he really isn't, he's your species. So first and foremost, it's a species different than your own, and it's deriving nutrients from that uh, host. And a good parasite will not kill its host because a dead parasite can't continue to take care of the host uh, of, of the parasite. So <clears throat> in general, a parasite may make you sick or run you down a little, but a great parasite will not do so much damage to the host, um, the species that it's living in, that it will lead to its demise because that's inefficient. What is a zoonotic disease or zoonotic disease? I've pronounced it zoonotic. That's a disease that can be passed from people to pets and, pe and pets to people. So that's really important because some of the parasites we're gonna talk about today have some significant health impacts on humans. So we're gonna talk about preventing it. And the number one thing is gonna be parasite control in the pet and the environment. So that means you're not just protecting the pet that you're living with from a parasite, you're protecting you, your family, everyone involved with that pet, you're protecting them as well. And if you're selling pets into the pet market, you have to be really aware that if you're selling a puppy to a family that may have someone that's very young, a child, someone who's immunocompromised because they're on chemotherapy or on medication for an autoimmune disease, or they've got AIDS or some other condition, you are gonna have a patient then that's a little bit more vulnerable to picking up a zoonotic disease. Uh, so it's important that we get good control. People can even get heartworm. It's pretty rare, but people can get heartworm disease. People can get a lot of these intestinal parasites we're gonna talk about. So in the interest of you and your reputation and what you're selling pets into the market for, you need great parasite control. You also need vector control for things like mosquitoes, ticks, fleas. Those are all important because those are ve uh, vectors of disease. And then of course, use good hand washing and good hygiene. So keep the yard picked up, keep the kennel picked up. Don't leave feces laying around. Wash your hands after you've handled any of these things. Um, really be careful with your hygiene. What kind of zoonotic diseases can we see? Well, we can see cryptosporidium. Um, and that was something that in Milwaukee about 20 years ago, 400,000 people in Milwaukee got cryptosporidium. 400,000, half of the population in Milwaukee. It was so bad that when you would call the doctor, they would say, don't come in, we can't see you. Sort of like what we saw during Corona. Um, they just could not accommodate all the patients that got sick because there was a 
water contamination break upstream. It came from dairy calves upstream from Milwaukee. The water treatment plant didn't adequately get rid of it. So we had cryptosporidium everywhere. It was a real mess. Um, trichinosis, trichinella, that's what we used to see in pork back in the 30s when pigs were fed garbage and they no longer are. So we don't worry about trichinosis in pigs anymore. So you can eat your pork slightly pink. Um, it's not required that you cook it into shoe leather consistency anymore because trichinosis is pretty well taken care of in pigs. Um, Bailey ascaris is spread through uh, raccoon feces. Roundworms and hookworms, very, very, very common parasites in our dogs and cats that live in our homes. Most tapeworms are not contagious to people that we see in dogs, but a kind of coccus is, and we're gonna talk about that. That's a very serious disease in people. Of course, ticks, um, ticks we share with dogs and other animals, and toxoplasmosis. Many of you have probably heard of toxo. That's the thing that we worry about, that cats can spread to pregnant women and cause damage to the fetus. As long as your cat doesn't go outside or you clean your litter box every 24 hours or less, you are not susceptible to toxo. But if you can talk your um, significant other into cleaning the litter box while you're pregnant, go for it. <clears throat> so what do I need to say about zoonotic diseases? Not much more. Practice good hygiene. Like seriously, don't do this. This is one of my very favorite pictures. I wish I knew who took it. Um, but need I say more about zoonotic diseases? They're just yucky. So practice good hygiene. So the most common worms that we see in dogs are gonna be roundworms and hookworms. We also see heartworm, whipworms, and tapeworms. So in this order, this is the frequency that we see them in. There are other intestinal parasites that we see commonly in dogs that are not worms, and those are gonna be Giardia and Coccidia. All right, so we're gonna talk about roundworms first because they are the most common intestinal worm. Um, they, this is a very pretty graphic of what they look like. I have other pictures that are a little bit more real but they live in the intestines and somehow manage to swim upstream when other food is going through, they manage to swim upstream and stay in the dog's intestinal tract. The life cycle is important because it can be spread fecal oral, meaning that uh, you can in the dog or a person can ingest the eggs of the parasite and end up with a parasite, parasite infestation. Um, but children can also ingest these roundworms. You hear about Sandboxes, keeping the sandboxes covered for toxo and for roundworms. There's a lot of reasons that we want to do that. So fecal oral is the most common transmission, but it can also occur transplacentally in the dog. Um, this is the only parasite that goes transplacental that I'm aware of. So in other words, when the female is pregnant, if at any point in her life, if she ever had roundworms ever, even as a puppy, even though you dewormed her, even though her fecal is negative, even though you have dewormed until you can't deworm anymore, if she had roundworms as a puppy, the stress of pregnancy and lactation reactivate those parasites. They go out of a cyst in her muscles, enter the bloodstream, into the circulation and cross the placenta and into the puppies. So when you hear people say puppies can be born with worms, this is why this is how, is puppies can be born with worms if the mother had roundworms and you didn't do the protocol that we're gonna talk about in a few slides. So fecal, oral, and transplacental. Symptoms of roundworms include diarrhea, weight loss, roundworms in the vomiting of the stool. Um, I had a phone call the other day from a cat that vomited up a roundworm, pretty common. Unthrifty coat, pot-bellied appearance. Um, they just generally don't look thrifty. They're, they're kind of scrawny looking across the back and kind of pot-bellied in the belly. So very important that we recognize this. How is it diagnosed? Well, you can see the worms pass in the stool or see them in the vomit. Um, that's relatively common. I have pulled um, dog laundry out of my washing machine and found roundworms in there. So uh, unfortunately, that's pretty unpleasant. Um, if you take a stool sample to your veterinarian, they will put it with a special solution, put it in the centrifuge, look at that sample under the microscope, and they will see the eggs, which are demonstrated in this picture next to the microscope. That's what the roundworm eggs look like. Or there's also an ELISA test run at some of the diagnostic labs to diagnose roundworms. Treatment consists of either using Nemex or Strongid, and we're gonna talk about all this in a little bit more detail when we get toward the end of the presentation. Nemex and Strongid are the same active ingredient. They're both parental pamoate. One is a small animal product, Nemex two is small animal, Strongid T is large animal. So there's a difference in how it's dosed, but they're both the same intestinal parasite product and they both are very effective. Um, the other thing that's not on this slide that is effective is piperazine, um, but many people don't use piperazine anymore. It's very inexpensive, it's very safe, but um, it has a really foul taste to it. Um, so I tend, it, it's got a very strange smell to it. When I was a little kid, we had pinworms and I can still remember the smell of piperazine. So 
I personally don't buy it and use it in my practice because when I open the bottle, I'm like, oh, this is terrible. So I don't do it. Um, but Nemex and Strongid are both flavored. They're very pleasant. They're kind of a banana pudding flavor. They go down dogs very easily. I can just squirt it in the bowl and the dogs will lick the bowl clean. Um, fenbendazole also can be used. It's labeled for puppies over six weeks of age. And then selamectin um, actually is not labeled in dogs for roundworms, but it is labeled for cats in roundworms. And I was a little curious about this because I think there's a lot of people who are still relying on selamectin as a good intestinal parasite control product for roundworms and hookworms in dogs. And in reality, it doesn't work that way. So last week when I was preparing for this, I was looking through the labels and was kind of curious about it. So I called the company that makes it. And the reason for that is that the selamectin, it's a topical product called Revolution. It's put over the shoulders and it doesn't work very well in dogs for intestinal parasites because it doesn't reach high enough levels. It does other parasites, which we'll talk about later in the presentation, but cats have a better level of selamectin than dogs because they self-groom. And so when the drug is applied topically, it's picked up in the bloodstream, carried into the circulation, and then redistributed in the oil glands of the skin. So on a dog, it just makes one pass and then it's done. In the cat, because they continually groom themselves, they're re-ingesting that selamectin. So we get roundworm control and hookworm control in cats with selamectin, but not dogs. So please do not rely on it as being the only product that you use for roundworm and hookworm control in the dog. All right, so roundworm and hookworm prevention, like I said, it's parental pamela weight in dogs under 10 pounds in my world. I use Nemax because I want to be accurate in my dosing. And that's dosed at one cc per two pounds of body weight. Strongid is 10 times more concentrated. Um, some people dose it at one per 20 pounds. Some people dose it at one per 10. I personally use it at one per 20, but either dose is fine. Either dose is safe. So you use one smaller dose with Nemex too, because it's the small animal product. And then Strongid is the large animal product. Again, this is the suspension that you wanna shake well when you get it. These can be dosed at two, four, six, and eight weeks, but you can start as early as one week of age if you have a significant problem with roundworms and or hookworms in your uh, facility. And you can deworm weekly. Um, the minimum recommendation is at two, four, six, and eight weeks but you can use it at a higher and more frequent dose. It will not prevent transplacental transmission of roundworms. And like I said, piperazine is another good drug. Um, but again, you have to measure it. I had a client that took a gallon of piperazine and dumped some into his puppy and the puppy came in toxic. So you can overdose these medications. Please weigh the puppy and please accurately dose your meds. Another way that we can prevent the roundworms, both prevent them in the intestinal tract of a dog or to prevent the transplacental transmission is to give fenbendazole during pregnancy and lactation. So that's what we're gonna talk about. And this is the dose. And I know somebody in the Q and A has already asked this question is how do I do that parasite prevention protocol that you talk about for during pregnancy and whelping? And it is a 10% product. If you use the suspension, this is the large animal product. You can buy a liter of it. So one liter will basically deworm a 60 pound dog through her entire pregnancy twice. So it's a lot of drug, but it's a lot less expensive than having sick puppies. Um, you don't lose puppies this way um, and you don't have to take the sick puppies to the vet. So you're gonna come out in the long run saving money. So this is dosed at one cc of the suspension, not the paste per four pounds of body weight. And you do that once a day from three weeks before she's due to whelp, so day 42, through the second week after whelping. So it's uh, till the puppies are 14 days old. So from day 42 of pregnancy to day 14 of lactation, every single day, once a day for five weeks. Is this fun? Absolutely not. Is it effective? Unbelievably. Can you talk to your vet about this? Please do. And if they say to you, I've never heard of this, this must be a new protocol. Well, the original protocol was published in 1983. That was a year after I graduated, so that was 40 years ago. So your vet is probably younger than me, or if they're not, I will give them an excuse for not knowing about this protocol. But it is not a new protocol. It has been established in the literature for a long time, and the people who do a lot of canine reproductive services use this protocol very reliably. When I've done this with clients, dogs, and we do the ultrasound, what we'll do is confirm pregnancy at the ultrasound, and then we'll talk to them about taking this product home with them once we confirm that the female is pregnant. And I've had clients come in and throw their arms around me when their puppies are at their eight-week visit and say, Dr. Greer, I have never had such healthy puppies. I can't believe it. Because instead of having that parasite migration through the gut, 
and um, making the puppies get sick and having diarrhea and all that stuff that's happening at the same time you're trying to wean them. They don't feel good. They come in kind of puny, they're sick. You're gonna have sick puppies if you don't do something like this. The other thing is you're more likely to have parvovirus, coronavirus, um, other diseases in the GI tract if you have parasites on top of having a, uh, an otherwise rundown puppy. So this will really make a difference in your breeding program if you're struggling with roundworms or hookworms. Now, selamectin can also be used for this. Selamectin is the same thing as Revolution. Um, I don't use the ivermectin protocol because there are too many dogs that can become toxic on the ivermectin, but you can treat this in the dam day 40 before she whelps. So again, at the ultrasound, you can know she's pregnant and then start the protocol 40, on day 40 of the pregnancy and then 10 days before she whelps. And then again, when the puppies are 10 days old and 40 days old and this commercially available product, again, this is the link in here. So this is in your notes um, and this will have some doses in a later slide. So hookworms look like this. I have personally never seen a hookworm come in in a dog's stool sample. Um, the graphic is prettier than the real thing. Um, they're very small. You're not typically going to see those. If you see something in the stool, it's almost always going to be roundworms or tapeworms. It has a fecal oral transmission as well, like the roundworm, but it can also drill through the skin of a person's foot. So if you walk through areas that the hookworms have been deposited in your yard, at the beach, whatever, um, it can go through the skin and into your um, circulation. And in the dog, instead of it going through the placenta, it goes into the milk. So just like the dog that had uh, parasites when she was young, if she had them, they will reactivate during the stress of pregnancy and lactation, um, circulate through and go through the milk and into the puppies. So they may not be born with worms, but by the time they're a couple of days old, they can already have parasites living in their gut. Symptoms, diarrhea, weight loss. This is a little different than roundworms because these attach to the lining of the intestine and they will suck blood. So you can have anemic puppies and they can be so anemic that they can profoundly be anemic and die from their anemia. So don't take hookworms as being something casual. Again, thrifty, uh, unthrifty coat, pop belly to parents, they just look like sick puppies. Diagnosis, eggs under the microscope or the ELISA test. Hookworm treatment, the same as roundworm treatment. So we don't have to dwell too much on that. Again, this prevents the transmammary transmission. Heartworm is probably the third most common parasite that we see. They are truly worms that live in the heart and the lungs. So when it was named heartworm, it was a great name. Um, you can see this many worms. It can be astounding how many worms can live in the dog's circulation and still have them walking around. The important thing about this life cycle is that it has to go through a mosquito. So a pregnant dog cannot transmit heartworm to her puppies. She has to have a mosquito bite, bite her, and then bite the puppies, and then they can get hook, uh, heartworm. But it is not directly transmitted from the bitch to the puppies. Symptoms of heartworm are cough, weight loss, um, exercise intolerance, panting, fainting, um, and even in the legs, they can go into kidney failure, they can go into liver failure. So it's a very nasty disease. They can migrate into the eye. There's a lot of really nasty symptoms. Um, the diagnosis is primarily done now on an ELISA test and frequently it's done on a test that also checks for Lyme disease, anaplasmosis and Ehrlichia. So if you hear about the SNAP40X test, it will check for heartworm and those three tick-borne diseases, Lyme, anaplasmosis and Ehrlichia. Um, you can see on X-ray that there are some changes on the X-ray that can be characteristic of heartworm disease. There is a filter test that we used to use in the old days where you actually look for the baby heartworms. Most veterinary clinics don't do that anymore. And you can see them showing up on ultrasound. I actually had one diagnosed this way at our practice a number of years ago. The dog came in with heart disease, uh, coughing. I listened to the heart, the dog had a murmur. We scheduled the dog for an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart. And the, the uh, ultrasonographer, the cardiologist said, oh, this dog has heartworms. She could see the worms in the ultrasound. Treatment consists of using doxycycline and prednisone prior to the arsenic injections, absolutely 100% strict rest for months, and then a series of arsenic injections. Typically one is given on one day and then you come back four weeks later and get two 24 hours apart. It's expensive, it's a big deal. You need chest x-rays, you need blood work, you need all kinds of things before you do this. Don't let your dog get heartworm. It's super easy to prevent. So please, please, please prevent it. Prevention includes ivermectin. It can be, um, as ivermectin itself, it can be ivermectin in a heartworm product. Uh, moxidectin is the injectable product that's given as ProHeart 12. Every 12 months, you can get an injection for this for your dog and um, it will prevent heartworm. You don't have to worry about a pill. You don't have to think about if the dog will take it or not. And moxidectin ProHeart 12 is safe for pregnant dogs and nursing dogs. 
The other frequently used products are milbamycin, which is going to be an interceptor and sentinel, and selamectin, which is revolution. So all of these drugs are very common, very safe. Absolutely, you should be using these on your dogs. There's no excuse for a dog to get heart room disease at this time with the kind of effective preventives that we have. Prevention, I usually try to avoid giving any of the preventives in the first three weeks of the um, pregnancy, just because I prefer not to give drugs during that first trimester when all the tissues are forming. Um, and read the label on your heartworm products. Make sure it says it's labeled for use in breeding dogs. Now, a breeding dog does not say pregnant dog. A breeding dog is a breeding dog. So if you have an eight-week-old male puppy at your kennel that's going to turn into your next favorite stud dog, he is a breeding dog, folks. He is not a pregnant dog. He is a breeding dog. So please, please, please read the label on your medications. Trifexis and Simperica are not labeled for use in breeding dogs. So do not let your vet send that home with you because they are not tested in those breeding dogs. Heartworm incidence is somewhat regional in the country. It has been found even in Alaska, despite the fact that mosquitoes have to transmit it. But the most prevalent areas are gonna be in the southeast part of the country where it's wet and warm most of the year. Um, we have some in Wisconsin. I've seen one case in Wisconsin that was a native dog that had not traveled outside of Wisconsin. She was eight months old. So it's not very common where we are, but it's much more common in the Southern tier of states where it's warm and humid. Whipworms, my next favorite parasite. These are kind of fun. They're tiny. Again, this compares it to a match, so you can see how small they are and how unlikely you are to see these in a stool. I have yet to see one of these brought into a, a, in a stool sample from a client. They primarily live in the large intestine of the dog. <clears throat> it does not spread through the placenta or through the milk like the roundworms and the hookworms. They will hang out in the large intestine and they will only shed intermittently. So you can bring in 10 stool samples and maybe only find them in one stool because they're not uniformly distributed through the feces. Symptoms include irritation of the gut, diarrhea, weight loss, bloody stools, anemia, all the same stuff we see with all the other intestinal worms. Um, on a fecal sample, they look like this. There is not an ELISA test at this point, but they're a very cool looking little egg. Uh, on a fecal. Treatment consists of sentinel, which is uh, milbamycin, drontel plus, which is uh, praziquantel, uh, panicure, which is um, fenbendazole, interceptor, again, milbamycin, picking up the stools. So please remember to keep the stools picked up. And if you have any of these intestinal parasites, not just whipworms in your yard, there is nothing you can spray on the yard that will kill those eggs. There used to be organophosphates many years ago. They've been off the market for 35 years. They were toxic, so we don't use those anymore. FDA and EPA don't let us have those anymore. But if you do have this in your yard, you have to remove the top six inches of soil, cover it with clean topsoil, and grow new grass. Um, or use a flamethrower and not burn down your kennel in the process of doing that. So be aware that they are very hard to get rid of in the soil, even in Wisconsin, in the winter where it's, you know, 10 degrees below zero, these parasites will still survive. Prevention, the easiest way is gonna be your monthly heartworm preventives that include things like an interceptor and sentinel. HeartGuard does not control whipworms, but interceptor, interceptor, sentinel, Iverheart Max, all of those will. Tapeworms are another very cool parasite. Um, you will frequently find these only by looking at the stool sample. Um, there's a number of different kinds of tapeworms. Uh, tenia is one of them, diplinium is another, echinococcus is the scary one. They look like this. Um, the picture on the left-hand bottom corner is the head or the scolex of the tapeworm. That's how it attaches to the intestinal lining. The middle picture on the bottom shows it attached to the intestinal lining. So they really do burrow in and hang on, which is how they stay attached while the stool is and the food is going through the gut, they stay. Um, they look like these little grains of rice, which was part of our poll question a few minutes ago. And the place you're gonna most commonly see it is gonna be on the rectum or the feces of the dog. Um, the bottom right-hand picture shows two tapeworm segments on the rectum of a dog. Um, and that's typically how we're gonna diagnose it. How are they uh, passed or how do they transmit? How, what is their life cycle? If it's diplidium, it involves a flea. So if you have diplidium, if you have tapeworms, you may have a break in your flea control. You may have fleas on your dogs. So be aware of that. It can also um, involve fertania ingesting the um, feces of small mammals like rabbits, sheep, uh, rodents, deer, pigs. Um, a lot of us in our part of the country have deer in our backyards. Um, you may as well, but rabbits are almost everywhere. Rodents are almost everywhere. So it's easy for your dog to go out in the yard and nibble on something and pick this up. 
Now, aconococcus is the really scary one because it can cause, if it gets into a person, a cyst in the brain or a cyst in the liver, and the cyst in the liver can look like a very aggressive form of cancer. So it is a very, very, very bad parasite. It is rare in dogs, but if your dog has it, it's incredibly scary. It typically involves a coyote, a dog, a fox, some kind of a canine, and sheep or rabbits. So most of us don't have sheep, but if you do, be really aware of a kind of caucus that you need to have good taper and parasite control because it can cause very serious disease in humans. Um, symptoms are the same as most other intestinal parasites along with itchiness around the rectum, um, weight loss, bell pot belly appearance, all that stuff. The diagnosis is rarely done on fecal sample because the eggs in this parasite sink to the bottom, the eggs in other parasites float to the top. So you can take in a stool sample with aprams in it and your vet may report back that there are no parasites and you'll be like, but I saw something and you can get really frustrated and I understand that. But if you see tapeworm segments, tell your vet, take a picture, grab your phone, take a picture, and then take that stool sample in with the picture and explain it to them so that they know they should be looking for tapeworms. Um, there is also a PCR or ELISA test, not commonly run at most of the diagnostic labs. So if you see tapeworms, tell your vet, tell your vet, vet tech. This is a great video of what a tapeworm segment looks like um, once it is passed in the feces. Um, you'll actually see this little tapeworm segment before it dries, it will be moving like this. So if you see this, capture it on your phone, get a picture of it or a video of it if it's moving and make sure your vet is aware that that's what you're seeing because it's very important that we get that information to the vet. All right. So um, tapeworms, Tinea, any of the parasite control products for tapeworms will get rid of it. That means Cestex, Proziquantol, and Fenbendazole. Um, for diplidium, um, Fenbendazole will not get rid of diplidium, so you have to use um, one of the other products if you have diplidium, and most of the time we don't identify which tapeworm it is. Um, Cestex cannot be used in pregnancy. Proziquantol and Fenbendazole can be used in pregnancy, so just be aware that those are safe. Um, Fembendazole does require a three-day course. The other drugs are one day. So just be aware of that. Also remember your flea control is really important if you have tapeworms. Giardia, almost everybody with multiple dogs at some point will have Giardia. The cute little picture here on the left is not how cute they actually are. They are very hard to find on stool sample. They are much easier to find on the ELISA test. It is very rare for dog Giardia to get into humans. We used to not be aware of this. So in the past, we've talked about this being zoonotic, but it is pretty rare for a dog Giardia to be in a human. It's almost always human Giardia is human and dog Giardia is Giardia in the dog. Symptoms again, same as all the other intestinal parasites. They don't feel good. There may be uh, weight loss, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, it can be possible to see these under the microscope, but it's very difficult to see them under microscopic exam. Um, the ELISA test, however, is very accurate. It can be run in your veterinary clinic if they have the Giardia test. If they don't, they can send it to the diagnostic lab. But this test can stay positive long after the cysts are gone, long after the dog is normal. So treatment success is not that the ELISA test turns negative. Treatment success is when the diarrhea goes away. And I see a lot of dogs, especially adult dogs that come in, we see a positive Giardia ELISA, but if they don't see the cysts and the dog doesn't have soft stools, I don't even treat them. I just tell the client, be aware of it. If the dog develops diarrhea, let me know and we'll get medication for you. But if we treated every single dog that had a Giardia positive test, you would absolutely lose your mind. It is not necessary to treat them. We only treat if they're symptomatic. Treatment consists of fenbendazole given daily for five to seven days, bathing the dog daily to keep the cysts from reinfecting the dog. So you have to put the dog in the tub and bathe it every day because the fecal material can retransmit it to the dog. Um, metronidazole can also be used. Sometimes we use metronidazole and fenbendazole at the same time if we can't get rid of the Giardia and the dog is still symptomatic with one of those two drugs, but we do not like the combination compounded together because it's not going to have the right ratio of fenbendazole to metronidazole. And metronidazole can cause a toxicity, especially in young puppies um, or the MDR1 dogs. I've seen multiple dogs with metronidazole toxicity. I've seen Samoyeds, Collies, um, poodles, a lot of different breeds can have this toxicity. So be very careful with metronidazole. 
I tend to rely on fenbendazole pretty heavily, but don't use the combination product. And the only time I will use secnitazole is if you've used fenbendazole and metronidazole and done your daily bathing and weighed the dogs and dosed it correctly and all the other requirements, and you're still having problems with Giardia. Secnitazole is not labeled for use in dogs. The only study we have on secnitazole is in the cat. Cats are not dogs, dogs are not cats. I know you all know that, but we don't, we can't just extrapolate what we know about cats to dogs. So I do not use secnitazole unless absolutely backed into the corner. And in fact, I don't think I've ever used it. I just know what's in the literature. Prevention. Um, so if you're trying to keep your puppies from getting Giardia, bathe the bitch before she whelps about three days, use the chlorconazole, get her good and clean, get it off her rectum, get it off her mammary glands, and then keep her really clean. Because if she goes out, has some diarrhea, walks back in, lays in the whelping box, and the puppies crawl through that diarrhea, they can get Giardia when they're very young. Keep the feces picked up, use your disinfectants, and fenbendazole during that last three weeks of pregnancy through the first two weeks of lactation will reduce the risk of the puppies getting it because she's not shedding cysts. It doesn't come through the mammary glands, it doesn't come through the milk, but if we have a bitch that's not passing Giardia in her feces, she's not gonna be able to infect her puppies. There used to be a vaccine on the market, that vaccine's been gone for years, so we don't have that. And do not use metronidazole during pregnancy and do not use metronidazole when the puppies are less than six weeks old. Next is coccidia, and it's almost invariable. If you have Giardia, you probably have coccidia. You may have one, you may have both. Very common to have coccidia in large groups of dogs as well, whether it's a shelter, a breeder, um, just somebody's home that has a number of dogs, very, very common. The challenge to coccidia diagnosis is they can look very much alike under the microscope. Now, when we send our fecals out for testing, they all go to a diagnostic lab, and I will often get a report back probably once a week that says this dog has coccidia, imeria, but it's not a parasite of the dog. So the dog was out eating rabbit droppings, deer poop, something, and picked up coccidia, but it was just traveling through the GI tract and it didn't take up residence there. So I don't treat those dogs. I do tell the people your dog is eating rabbit poop or deer poop because I think they should know, but they do not need to be treated. Um, again, this is fecal oral. So like a lot of the other parasites, the dog eats the um, species of animal that had it or eats their droppings. And again, the same symptoms, they're all pretty much the same, diarrhea, doesn't feel good, maybe vomiting, dehydration, yada, yada. And like I said, you can see a difference between rabbit, bird, and dog coccidia, but I'm not good enough to tell that. That's what the diagnostic lab is trained to do. Treatment consists of Albon in my hands, Albon and only Albon. Totrazoril is not labeled for any species in the United States. If you're buying Totrazoril, you're buying it from a country that is not the US. There is no tetrazoral law labeled for US. And if you really look closely, we were looking at this uh, last week. Um, some of the people that are importing this aren't even a real address in the United States. They, I looked it up. I looked up one of the, the importers and they don't even exist in the United States. It's an apartment building. And you know that they're not actually the company that's distributing it. They're just a phantom address for this drug. So be very, very careful what you're doing. Panazaril, I will use, but I will not use the large animal product. I will only use it if it's compounded by a compounding pharmacy and only if Albon has failed. So again, hygiene, bathe her before she whelps, keep the feces picked up. There is no transplacental or transmammary transmission, only through the stool. Again, I had puppies at my house that were three weeks old and they had coccidia and I'm sure they got it because the bitch had some soft stool on her pants. They came in. They crawled through it, she picked it up, or the puppies picked it up from her from the loose stool. Um, do not use Albon or any other sulfonamide during pregnancy or when the puppies are less than four weeks old. Albon during the pregnancy can cause midline defects even up to day 45 of the pregnancy. I had one client that lost her entire litter because she gave Albon for two days during the pregnancy and lost a litter of frozen semen puppies. It was very sad, so please don't do that. There are other some unusual parasites, paragonimus, I've diagnosed one time in 40 years of practice. Lungworms, we've diagnosed once. These are rare. We're not going to spend a lot of time on them. Just be aware that they do exist. And if your vet clinic gets a report back that says they see these in the feces, you should address that. So again, the basic principles, weigh your puppies accurately, your dogs accurately, calculate the dose correctly, shake it well and distribute it into smaller bottles, avoid the paste products, remove the feces and follow disinfectant instructions. So please do those things for best parasite control. All right. 
Um, puppy medications. So these are going to be our model principles for um, treating patients with possible parasites or preventing them. Um, for puppies, I use Nemex if they're under 10 pounds. I use Strongit if they're over 10 pounds. So when they're really small at two weeks of age, I'm going to use Nemex. But if I have a Labrador puppy in it at six weeks of age, it's 10 pounds, then I'm going to switch to Strongid T. That's dosed at one cc per two pounds for Nemex 2 and one cc per 10 to 20 pounds for Strongid. Um, if the bitch was on fenbendazole, then you don't need to do that initial deworming at weeks one through eight. Um, fenbendazole, um, this is off label, like I talked about before, when we use it during the last five weeks or the last three weeks of pregnancy through the first two weeks of lactation, five weeks total. The label says three days, so this is off-label use, but like I said, it's been documented for 40 years. And my dose is one cc per four pounds of body weight, whether it's the mother dog or the babies. Um, as soon as the puppies are over six weeks old, you can use fenbendazole under six weeks. It is not labeled as safe. And you can do it during pregnancy and lactation. Um, if you've started deworming the puppies at week one to two, you can use the parental PAMA weight until they're six weeks old. At six weeks, you can give fenbendazole for five days. And then at eight weeks, hopefully by then you're sending them out to their new homes. They can go on to the regular monthly heartworm preventives, which most of them we're gonna include intestinal parasite control products. So HeartGuard, Simperica, Interceptor, Iverheart, Sentinel, all of those are going to have a product in it that will give you not just heartworm prevention, but intestinal parasite control as well. And if you do wanna use the Celemectin product, I have this in the handout. At departure, this is another little bit of tidbit information that's not well known, is when you're selling your puppies for the last three days that you're at your kennel and the first three days in their new home, so send this with them, if they are on Elbon, you will reduce the risk of them developing parvovirus. Yeah, it's hard to understand because parvo is a virus and this is a dewormer and why does an antibiotic slash dewormer prevent parvo? And the answer is good gut health. So if we stabilize the gut bacteria, the puppies are less likely to get diarrhea and therefore less likely to get parvo and something else serious. So this is a great protocol. If you've had difficulty with puppies leaving your facility and ending up with parvo, whether you're a rescue, whether you're a breeder, whether no matter what you do, this will reduce your parvo risk. I use the suspension. It tastes yummy. Um, it's a yellow, thick, viscous liquid, but it tastes delicious and the puppies will taste this, take this really readily and it's easy to dose. Um, pregnant dams. So we've talked about puppies. Now we're going to talk about pregnant dams. You can either do the fenbendazole protocol that we've talked about twice, or from the time the puppies are a week old, Nemex or Strongid, and then at six weeks of age, fenbendazole um, it can be given to the bitch and to the puppies. And the day you deworm the bitch is the same day you should deworm the puppies. So if you're doing it weekly or every two weeks, that's what you should be doing. CAPSI, which is the Companion Animal Parasite Control pa Council, capsivet.org is a great resource for all of this information. And again, that's a resource link that's in your notes. For the pregnant dam, once her puppies are eight weeks and weaned, you can put her on Revolution or Selamectin once a month, plus Nemex or Strongid, because remember, Revolution and Selamectin do not get intestinal parasite, roundworm and hookworm in the dog. Um, or you can use the commercial heartworm products that contain the roundworm and hookworm preventive, such as HeartGuard, Interceptor, Sentinel. For the adult dogs in the kennel that are not pregnant, you want to do tapeworm control and flea control. So make sure that you're using products that are appropriate for those that may be Revolution or uh, Selamectin. Those do a great job. Um, for your flea and tick control, um, it will control mites, uh, lice, some other creatures, but you'll need to do something else for intestinal parasite control. And for Giardia and Coccidia, I don't routinely put dogs on any of those preventives if they have normal stools. So even if the ELISA test is positive and the stools are normal, I don't treat them. If they become clinically normal, you can stop treatment. Just be aware that those tests, especially the GRDA test, can stay positive for a long time. Symperica Trio is not labeled for use in breeding dogs. A lot of dogs are coming through our practice that are putting, being put on that. If they're breeding dogs, they should not be on it. Trifexis uh, is not labeled for use in breeding dogs and the Seresto collar is not. So be very careful what you're putting on your dogs during um, the time that they're in a breeding program. Remember breeding dogs are breeding dogs. That may be a male dog that's eight weeks old. Um, I know he's not pregnant, but be careful. Um, some of the topical products are labeled safe for breeding dogs like Frontline. Some of them like Vectra 3D are not. 
so be aware. Um, we have this really great flea and tick finder that was developed on our website. So you can go to this link. And again, this is in your notes. Click on this and it will walk you through an algorithm that will help you decide which medication would be best for you to get a prescription from your veterinarian for. All right, so flea and tick preventives, avoid during the first three weeks of pregnancy and read the label to make sure it's breeding. it says breeding dogs. You can Google it and find very easily on the uh, website, you can look for the product insert and you can read the information. All right, other parasites. This is just for next time. Um, other parasites are fleas, ticks, lice, and mites. So we're gonna talk again, like we did before, the parasite appearance, the life cycle, the symptoms, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. The most common things that we're gonna find are gonna be fleas and ticks. We find them in all climates. We find them in Wisconsin. The most common time to see Lyme disease in Wisconsin is January. I know that's hard to understand, but that's when the ticks are moving. Um, these parasites, the fleas and ticks will bite humans and dogs. They will spread diseases like tularemia, tapeworms, you wanna make sure you're using your control and treatment products year round. So even in the Northern climates where it gets cold, you wanna be doing these year round frontline brevecto selamectin on a year round basis. Um, ticks again, same thing. Be sure you're doing good control. Um, especially we see Lyme disease in Minnesota, Wisconsin and the Northeast states. So be very careful with your products because you don't want ticks in your house. You don't want ticks on you. Um, it's just not any fun. So um, there's a lot of this information in our pandemic puppy book. So this is a great resource for your new puppy buyers. Um, so be sure that you've got a good resource. It goes through behavior, goes through spay and tick, it goes through spay and neuter, goes through all kinds of things in here. Um, this is our reproduction book. So again, a great resource for you if you're um, raising puppies or having puppies. And I wanna thank everybody for hanging in there. And we have like two seconds left for questions. So I really apologize for that, but we have access to your PCPs, so please don't hesitate to call. I cannot personally answer every single question, but the PCPs will get any unanswered question from them to me. If it stumped the PCP, they'll send it on to me. Dr. Greer, just any tips on giving some of these dormers, people are saying, you know, don't taste the greatest. So any tips on getting your, your dog to, to take some of these that maybe aren't the best tasting dewormers? Yeah, and the, the uh, fenmendazole honestly is not a great tasting dewormer. It's not fun to give. You can mix it with peanut butter. You can mix it with canned dog food like Stardomoose. You can mix it with Splenda, um, vanilla pudding, anything that's, that's gonna flavor it and make it a little bit sweeter um, will work really well. My favorite for pills is miniature marshmallows. They're slippery when wet and it's easy to slit and pop a pill into that. So there are definitely ways you can get medications into your dogs that are effective. Awesome. I've never heard that one before. Thank you again, Dr. Greer, so much for all of this great knowledge. And again, call our pet care pros if you have a further question. Have a great rest of your day. Hi, if you're watching on YouTube, consider subscribing to the Revival Animal Health YouTube channel. If you have a pet health question, call our pet care pros at this number and don't miss our other pet health videos.